word tomorrow. Now tomorrow. What is the definition? How longitudinal is tomorrow? Right? So I think three very magical words. So my compliments to the organizers for choosing what appears a very simple theme. But each of these issues for business leaders and HR practitioners is actually a challenge of a lifetime. So I'm going to use a little deck, five, six themes I'll try and uh, uh, talk about. Hopefully you will not agree with many of them. But the hope also is that there will be something that you will nod your heads over. right? And the idea is more to leave these as provocations, as invitations to action, because you have the whole day to deliberate. But very importantly, I think it is a time when HR can make tomorrow. And it is with that request and hope that I present this to you. Is the slide OK? How does it go? Does it, does it change? We are still in today. It's not tomorrow yet. Doesn't work. Just help me with this, or I'll ask you to change, or I'll speak extemp. OK, it's working? OK, perfect. Thanks. Future of work. What really a lot of our HR thinking, our HR strategy flows from really an organizational strategy. Many times I'm asked, so Prabir, what's the HR strategy of the company? The HR strategy of a company, and that's been my experience of having worked with some of the largest companies in India, cannot be divorced from your organizational strategy. The HR head is the chief organization officer today. I don't think it's just an HR. That is a very, very outdated view within HR and also for the board. I think the world has changed. And the future of work is so important. What is work going to look like? What business will you be in? Will you take your product and service that you've done for many, many years as sacrosanct and then look for clients who will possibly you can go and peddle with? Or will you change your work thinking? And I'll have a slide when I'll talk about the customer. But it is very important to imagine and reimagine all the time what will your work look like? What will your company do? What is the start point? Are you going to be a prisoner of your past? Or will you create your own future? These are hardcore issues. And I do not absolve HR leaders of saying that will come from someone. And then I will do the downstream. That era is over. You cannot design a workplace of tomorrow if you do not know what's the future of work. How will work get done? So what's the nature of work? How will that work get delivered to the end client? Akhil talked about in his last S. And I want to pick that up. I don't think the world of employment as we understand in HR is going to exist in the way that we've seen for so many decades. But does it mean that HR's role in creating a future workplace will get subverted or become diminutive? The answer is no. I used to head HR for Tata Motors and I remember creating a 12 member HR team. I hired them, created a team because when you buy a car, you don't meet an employee of the company. And HR cannot say, I'm only responsible for employees of the company. You're responsible for the future of your business, for delivering your business today and sustaining your business tomorrow. And therefore, if the dealership is where the experience and the buy, make or buy decision gets created, you cannot say that the dealers, employees, and me, well, we are poles apart. It doesn't make sense. Now, a classical HR head would say that, well, that's not my job. But it is your job because that's where you make or unmake your business. And then you use these 12 people to handhold and train the dealerships because they don't have the wherewithal, the muscle, the HR, contemporary HR thinking of hiring right or rewarding right or retaining right, right. So a lot of it will depend on what is your business model. What is your work going to look like? Will it be always what you've done with incremental changes or will you subvert? Nokia today is a bad example to cite, but if Nokia had believed in what they did, they would only be in the business of wood. They would not be doing the kind of things that they did. And this, as again, Akhil, you beautifully said, in the context of both suddenness and speed becomes very critical. And therefore, building is something which you cannot afford. One day over time, I will do it. It doesn't happen that way anymore. You've got to almost build tomorrow, 23 hours for building an organization. I'm stealing your example. 
This is what is expected of you. You can't do it. Get out of this business. It doesn't make sense. Someone else will, will do it for you. So future of work is a very, very important strategic choice to make as a company and as HR. And it's your job. It is your responsibility to be a co-conspirator, co-creator of this particular decision. Am I connecting? Does this make sense? Yeah. So this is the first provocation that I would uh, have. And I hope this time it works. Yes, it does. Right. If you are going to be in that kind of business, which you are looking at the future, and future need not be 100 years from now. I don't even know whether 20 years is, a, is too long. It's too long. Right. How will you redefine talent? What, when, how will you hire? He talks about the Unilever experience. First, that is still downstream. My first question and provocation is, do you even know what talent you need to build the business that you are wanting to create for tomorrow? What skill sets are needed? I once worked with a very large Fortune 500 company as its HR head, and I asked the manufacturing director for all the time I was there, tell me how will your shop load look like five years from now? And I never had an answer. The inability of many, many leaders and line managers to even see five years from now is so limited. But it is so critical because a lot of your make or buy decisions for talent will rest on it. If you have to make it, do you have the time? And do you have the raw, sustained uh, material that you can mold into relevant talent? And to buy, I don't even know whether there's a market or a catchment where I can buy talent from. I personally have very strongly practiced and believed, and I feel that will only intensify looking cross-industry, cross-function. It is, it is absolutely disgusting sometimes to believe that people want a plug-and-play guy. Line managers and HR guys. Has he worked in competition in that industry, in that function? Then he's the right guy. Headhunters, as bad. Their inability to influence freshness in thinking. So it's a very incestuous reality we have created. And when we talk about building organizations for tomorrow, you can't build an organization for tomorrow by doing or looking at talent in the way you defined them for all these years. Are we willing to change our mind? Are we willing to do something that we've never done? Otherwise, we will be like good Icarus. We'll keep flapping our wings, and one day we'll drop dead. And it's not easy. It sounds easy to say this, but it's not easy. Because past success is very difficult to let go. But this is very important. What is the talent that you're looking for? And I'm not looking only at leadership and board and all that rubbish. The people who make the difference. I sit on RBI's HR advisory board, and in the last some years, they've shrunk from 40,000 to 14,000 governmental establishment. It's possible. And the kind of things that are happening, we don't know. But the nuance of that skill and, that, and, and the talent is going to be very different than what was classical. I don't even know whether the patterns of recruitment selection should remain. So everything is about what is it that you want to be in the future. Start from there and work backwards and work backwards today. I think I heard this in the morning from either Akhil or an earlier speaker. This entire issue is about both co-creation and co-evolution. For far too long, we have only stuck ourselves to co-creation. Multiple stakeholders get together, you co-create. Co-create? It's a discrete event. I don't know whether it's relevant three years later, two years later, five years later. How do you mutate? How do you co-evolve? How do you destroy something? How do you add on something? And this almost co-sharing this entire thing from genesis to evolution and closing the loop with continuous iteration is going to be very, very critical. As HR, it's our job. It's not no longer about just the union or some uh, statutory compliance, nothing that is going away. But this is your job. How will you ensure how will you work with your leadership? How will you coach your leadership? How will you show the mirror to your leadership? And it takes courage. It is no longer about ending at co-creation. It is really about co-evolution. Everything will mutate. And the earlier you are able to mutate, the better the possibility of survival and hopefully the cause for you to thrive. But it's, it's not easy. And this is what you, if you ask me, is HR's strategic shift. 
you're not going to be in the business of doing. That's not your job anymore. At least that's not the way I have, I have looked at my job for three decades. Your job is actually to get people to do their job. And it's very tough to get someone to do their job. And this is the strategic shift from HR. It's no longer about running payroll. There are much smarter people who can do that for you. Right? Your job is not about doing. Your job is really about getting it done. And for that, you need to understand your business. And Akhil, you talked about that. I don't expect HR guys to be the best accountants, best salespeople, best R&D scientists, best manufacturing people, or whatever else. I'm not expecting. But do you understand where value gets created? Do you understand where value gets leached? Your job is simple. Your, va your job is to maximize value or minimize value er erosion. And you use levers of organization. Talent, systems, policy, process, organization, design, whatever else to do either this or reduce this. That's it. But it is so important, therefore, this eighth standard example that you uh, cited is very clear. Can you explain to me your business? If you cannot explain to me your business in two minutes, you don't know your business, period. You don't know your business. The board doesn't spend more time than this in any case, right? I've seen enough boards. They don't spend uh, more time. So you've got to get, give them what they need immediately, right? What's the core issue? And therefore, co-creation and co-evolution is a very important dimension for HR practitioners. And for that, we need to up our game. The way we think, the way we envision, the courage it takes, the foresight, the willingness to kind of rock the boat, do the counterintuitive, that is what is going to help us on this journey. Otherwise, just to do what we've always done, honestly, AI is there uh, to help you with uh, everything that Akhil has already alluded to. And the reason I'm bringing all this up, and I put this in the center of my uh, flow, is this. The way I visualize organizations of tomorrow, any organization, there will fundamentally be only two things that will build and sustain and nurture the organization. One is innovation and the other is customer centricity. So let me take a couple of minutes and talk about why do I believe that this is important. doesn't matter what is the nature of your business, including my first job as a civil servant. The government of India itself needs to innovate and get customer centric. I'm not absolving anyone. You are a uh, uh, an NGO, you will need to innovate and get more customer centric. It is not just about a commercial organization. You are the army. You need to innovate and get, get customer centric. Your, your definition and the nuance could vary. And the reason I say this is innovation is not always going to be about big bang invention. People believe when they talk about innovation, it's invention. But I'm not talking about invention. I fundamentally believe everything can be done better or not done at all. Don't do it. I've just moved to my own little house, the smallest house in my life, as I've started my own uh, venture. And I commissioned a firm. It's a startup in a way, a new generation firm. But I've been telling the guy who's uh, interfacing with me on the site that actually you guys have a huge HR problem because the left hand, right hand, they don't know each other. And the client doesn't, is not bothered really. You can innovate your entire workflow. And this is, mind you, a very new age company set up by the usual IT, I am kind of folks. So obviously they know their mind, but it's not working. As a client, I can tell you it's not working. They are not an efficient organization. They're very good with a marketing blitzkrieg, but they're not an efficient organization. How can you stop back and innovate? And there are small tweaks you can do. And you can actually cut down by 20% the time that it takes for you to finish a project and possibly multiply the experience of the customer. There will always be an issue of the customer. Who is your customer? Maybe your customer you will have to change. You will have to redefine. Maybe you will have to tell your existing customers possibilities of where you can help that the customer is not conscious of. Apple is that talked of example when iPhone or iPad or whatever else got done. But it doesn't matter what your nature of business is. If we cannot innovate, and that doesn't end the next slide. I'm going to connect with, uh, therefore, why and how, and the customer centricity. You cannot, as an HR guy, say the sales guy is the guy who manages the customer. How many of you go out to the field? How many times do you meet the customer, your retailer, your, you know, how many times do you, are you just a fly on the wall watching an interaction happen? 
If you don't do that, it's very difficult for you to sit in the office and be able to actually help build organizations for tomorrow. Because organizations of tomorrow are going to get created by the muck, the experience, the, the freshness of thinking, the constraints of today. And we've got to therefore go out. I was mentioning to some people before the session, in an HR itself, are we bringing enough plurality? Are we getting non-HR people to spend some time in the HR function? Are you going out? And it is far too cliche to say, oh, marketing nikar sector. I'm sure Akhil, I would have been a good marketing guy in Unilever. You know, honestly, I can sell ice cream better than uh, the guy who sells ice cream in Unilever. But it's the mindset. It's the mindset. And this is very core to my belief of what organizations of tomorrow will rest on. If these pillars are not fundamental, anything else you do, but if this is missing, I don't think you can build organizations for tomorrow. And therefore, as HR people, it is our job to keep reminding, to keep hand-holding people to believe that uh, this is something that must happen. Which brings me to the last couple of points. It is therefore the kind of culture that you will create. I heard someone talk about, you know, the culture fit. And I hear this very often, particularly in HR, I hear it all the time. Culture fit. I don't hire for culture fit. I don't honestly hire for culture fit. And there are people here in the room who I have hired. Right? I don't look. Culture is not static. Don't damn your culture. Both ways. D-A-M and D-A-M-N. Don't damn it. Allow it to flow. flow. Well, is Kathak part of Indian culture? Kathak? Anyone's heard of Kathak? It is? It is not? It is. Imagine I'd asked you this question in the 11th century. What would you have said? No one knew of Kathak. The point I'm making is, in the world as we are experiencing in the world of tomorrow, you cannot say, this is my culture. The culture was contextual. And so beautifully, uh, you said, it was contextual. It made sense at that time. Someone told me that the appraisal system you designed in Dr. Reddy is probably even now after whatever, 15 years it's running. I said, God bless. <laughs> Honestly, I moved an electronic system to paper and pen at that time. Maybe they've again automated it, but the system is the same. I personally believe it's not on. There was a reason why that happened. And therefore, it's very important to understand that when you want to create a winning culture, it's not culture for the sake of culture. How does it matter? 80 years, it made sense. 81st year, it is not making sense. Please do not be a prisoner of your past. You cannot survive unless you build, change, and this is very tough. This is extremely tough because to let go of the past is very difficult. You can call it legacy, you can call it the pride. And I do not believe, at least from my little thinking, that is a, it is either or. You can still be proud of your past, but don't become a prisoner of your legacy. You've got to design a culture. You've got to repudiate things which so far you celebrated, but it doesn't add up to uh, tomorrow. Bring in things that are relevant because if you want to be innovative, you want to be customer centric, but all your people practices and your cultural norms are supportive of a very command and control hierarchy, you're not going to win. So how do you reimagine and strategize the entire thing? You cannot be managing performance when you need to enable performance. It's a small word change, but if your culture doesn't shift from performance management to performance enablement, Get out of the way, Mr. Boss. You don't add value. It's a big culture change. And this is what, as trustees, it is HR's difficult job. Because boards don't want to change. CEOs don't want to change. Many people don't want to lose their political uh, fiefdoms. You talked about digital. I'm deliberately not talking about digital. It's about information democracy. Imagine, my God, that so far I knew everything. Now everyone will know everything. These are big changes to the culture that you want to create. It is a big job for HR to focus on. And the last slide. Finally, you can do every system process technology deployment, but you do not get the right leadership in your organization that you're building for tomorrow. You will not win. Chances are you'll not even survive. Leadership beyond leaders is then how many went to Harvard, what, and to me, it is trite and irrelevant. Be in the business of building leadership. And the reason I say this, apart from all the other obvious ones, is leadership is about building your redundancy. 
the biggest problem is when leaders don't go away and you become the constraint to your organization's survival and growth as the world is changing because your answers are always stuck in time. This is what I did when I was there. Yes, sir, you were right. It made sense at that time. Build your redundancy. Step away. Let someone else move forward. It is very difficult. No one wants to retire, honestly. And there are enough examples even in our corporate India. No one wants to retire. No one wants to let go. How will you ever change? Because the way you think is still, you were a successful leader. But you will be the reason why your company is not going to be relevant as it goes forward. So please, 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 if you don't do anything else, do the last slide. Build leadership in your companies if you want to build organizations for tomorrow. Because everything else you can buy, you can change, you can rewire. But this is tough. And this is what will define the agenda and its success, whether you will build organizations for tomorrow or not. It's a very, very tough ask. So ladies and gentlemen, this is really what I wanted in the rapid fire to leave you as possible thoughts, reflection, hopefully some churn. Not easy. There are no obvious easy answers. But one thing is clear. If you do not start today, you're already a day too late. You, we will make mistakes. We will make course corrections as we go along. But the fact of the matter is building organizations for tomorrow is possibly that opportunity of a lifetime that if we miss, we'll only have ourselves to blame. So good luck and God bless you guys. And uh, uh, I'm happy to take any rotten eggs, tomatoes, anything that you want to, you know, any comments, clarifications. I think we've got 10 minutes for that and I'm happy to respond to them. Any, any reactions, questions, disagreements, violent agreements? Go ahead, sir. Yes. Uh, you mentioned about the culture is dynamic and it will evolve over the yeah. period of time. However, the organizations will have some basic values uh, that it will, uh, it will want to keep on for a longer time, right? Uh, so how do you manage uh, both of these things together? Great question. So first, please remember, when we talk about values, many a time we believe moral science values is organizational culture. I'm not talking integrity will go away. Of course, it's very important, right? If some values indeed are relevant for today and tomorrow, by all means, continue. But there are many things stated and more importantly, unstated but practiced. Unstated, no one is going to say, we believe in siloed culture. No organization is going to say that. But you know that's the culture of a company. You can smell that culture. It's a very titular company. The guy has to interview me, he'll wait, get me to wait for three hours. That's the pattern in the company. You can smell it. No one will write it. The point I'm making is question it, identify it, question it. Right? I also very strongly believe, because I use the word innovation and customer centricity, I like to believe that there should be culture plus. Hire for culture plus. Are you adding to the biodiversity in your culture? The reason why companies do not survive and thrive and are not relevant for tomorrow is they become overly monoclonal. Culture has to always keep getting injection. So for example, I would always, and many people who worked with me, uh, uh, you would recall, I've always said, people would say, yes, sir, you're right, sir. Now as a 23-year-old officer in the government of India, I only served or I was served. So I started my career like that. I was never an individual contributor. I moved to the corporate sector. It took me three months to start saying first name. My first boss said, I'm Girish. Call me Girish. Yes, sir. Because that is how you were inducted. Private sector companies all have worked with almost the biggest and the best. It's been a nightmare for me, but I've succeeded somewhat of changing the top leaders. What difference does it make if you are not called sir? Does it change your increment, your bonus, your rating? Nothing changes. But it sends a signal. Do you need your boss's approval for that? No. But it changes. It unfreezes. It becomes more informal. So that's what I meant. That, you know, when you choose what adds. So repudiate all that is not helping you for tomorrow. Bring in what is doing. But reinforce culture by rewiring your, all your HR system. The way you hire, review, rep, reprimand, recognize, appreciate. Does that help? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? Yes, please. Yeah. Where uh, I came into uh, 
IT industry and in government also with NISD. So I have seen that uh, the IT leaders who are there, who were the innovators, they would keep the code with them. And when the code is with them, the management would not get rid of those leaders. So how do we go ahead and change the leaders Brilliant. to leadership? Brilliant. That's the reason I have written. Go beyond the person, the person in the box. This entire issue of tacit knowledge being with me, the entire thing of not withering away, the entire thing of technically retiring but not ceding control. And there are, we won't take names, right? Too many. No one wants to let go. I mean, if ever I write a book, I'll have enough to write. But the fact of the matter is, this is the reason why we become prisoners of that little one mind. Nothing wrong, it made sense at a certain time. But imagine if it were to be pollinated, imagine it were to be mutated, imagine someone else built it. So the word that I'm using is leadership is really going beyond the persona of the leader. So a lot of what we do is really about the individual. For example, if even if you go beyond leadership, I have never liked to send one guy to Harvard for an AMP program. I think it is an absolutely stupid mistake that companies do. I would not do it in my, under my charge. Always build a cohort. Get that five Harvard professors to come here and train 50 people. You're building a cohort group. You're building at least a network which hopefully will make a difference. One guy, you spent whatever million dollars, he has a great time, he will write on his resume that he is an AMP from Harvard. What changes in the company? Nothing changes. So this is a mindset issue of how do you actually broad-based leadership, and leadership is not at the top, leadership is right through, than just to focus on leaders, right? And, uh, and this is exactly the worry that I have. It is far too monopolized in the minds of few for organizations to unleash the possibilities and the potential that tomorrow will present to itself. So you're exactly right and I completely agree with you. Yes, ma'am. Um, we talk about teamwork and so many other competencies. So I just wonder, uh, should we not have something like a change mindset? So, I mean, so as one of the skill, or maybe something which is because this is a this is this seems to be one common thread which is coming out. Because today we are talking about some change. Tomorrow we'll talk about another change. But I think this change mindset itself is absolutely. something. So that's up to the companies to decide. But again, you know, the rebel in me. Fundamentally, I've been a rebel in my entire three decades, right? I've always been pushing for change. Why does it happen like this? Why does it happen? Why does it have to happen like that? Why does Reliance have to work six days a week? Why not five days a week? Why a fast track program cannot be designed in the government of India? As a 26 year old, I did it. The fact is you can write anything in your framework. The issue is, are you wanting to actually encourage a guy with a change mindset? Or will you find him a rebel? Will you find him difficult or too hot to handle? How will your ecosystem get designed? So my problem is not with placards and hoardings and posters and what you write. That's the easy part. You can decide whatever you want to write. The question is, how is it all adding up? How are all your different practices and programs and policies and leadership behavior, the people you select or reject? Suppose the guy is a brilliant jerk. I'm just making another example, right? But he's absolutely non-collaborative. And you said collaboration is my core value, cultural value. What will you do? He has that in his mind, but he's a brilliant jerk. What would you do? And that is where, when the moment of truth comes, organizations buckle. All the way from the board down, unfortunately. One of my favorite lines, and I tweet and I write a lot, and I remember one line that I have kept writing, when will we start leading a life of convictions and not consequences? When? Each one wants to survive my increment, my bonus, my longevity. What can happen? You can walk out. What is the worst that can happen? You'll not have a job. Maybe you'll start giving jobs to people. It's possible. But do you have the courage? So the point that I'm making is you can write anything. And I absolutely agree with you that fundamentally the willingness to change, the agility, the willingness to uh, be curious, these are fundamental things to look for in people. Don't look at degrees. I once was tutoring or coaching uh, one of the very senior executives, a promoter in one of the companies I worked in, I said, please look for hiring people who can do it rather than who have done it. 
Because every time you want to look at a guy who has done it, now there is no excitement for a guy who has already done it to come and do it for you. I am the guy who does not want to do it. So I always remember Dr. Reddy and its CEO at that time and I always say he is the guy who actually took the risk on me. Everyone else has only harvested me. Right? But he took the risk. He did not have to take the risk. So the fact of the matter is look for people who are willing to think differently, who are willing to challenge, who are willing to uh, visualize differently. That there is far too much of mediocrity and conformance that I see in corporations around. And that is one that is going to slow organizations, possibly decay organizations. So change my uh, mindset, 100%. But I am saying don't leave it there. Writing your competency grid and five, I, that's the other complexity I don't like about HR. Right? Make it simple. It should be very intuitive. Whether I remember fifth version of fourth line, who cares? I don't remember. How can I expect? There are people who worked on my team. They would remember. If you, your HR policy, first junk 50% of your HR policies. And if an HR policy cannot be more than one page, I will not approve. In any company I've worked, if an HR policy is more than a page, junk it. It will not get my approval. Don't make life so complex. Simplify it. But it's all about unleashing the possibility. It's all about what can go wrong. And believe you me, I have seen more from the power of possibilities than the worries of risks and failures. It's just about think different. Think, think at, at a very different level. You know, I, on LinkedIn, I write things and sometimes I find people saying, oh, but you're talking as if, you know, that's not the way the world is. The way the world is will never change if all of you want to be in that world and stop cribbing. We have a choice. Either we have to be part of the change, we have to change things or we have to stop cribbing. You can't crib and just continue doing whatever you've done. Right? So that's, that's the effort. So I love this uh, statement because it cannot be done just because we aspire and we want and we dream. It doesn't happen. You've got to confront and many things, in fact, in building will need destroying. And unless you choose to destroy some things which has got you to this point, you will not build for tomorrow, even individually. This is the first time in my life I am an individual contributor, Akhil. I have never in my life been an individual contributor. Fresh out of college, DTC buses and Stevens College, that was the last time. Uske baad, Bharat Sarkar, Lal Bhatti, Saman, you know, Feudal Comfort, Bungalow, and big corporate jobs. And suddenly, for the first time, I am an individual contributor. But you've got to change, learn the things. So I'm trying to learn how the printer really works this way and how does that happen. I've never done. I never knew how gas was booked for all these years, right, by the way. If you have to change, you have to change. You have got to learn. And that is the invitation that I want to uh, uh, leave everyone with. All right. If there are no other questions, thank you very much for listening to me. And uh, hopefully, the rest of the day, you will have a lot more coming your way. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Prabhir Jha, for asking some fundamental questions of them not very comfortable posing some answers and expecting others in this wonderfully interactive session to at least think about them, if not come up with answers. I'd like to request Mr. Rakesh Sinha, co-founder and member Governing Council Shared Services Forum and Executive Director and CEO of Our Value Group to please come and present a memento to Mr. Prabhir Jha. Yeah. We are more grounded now. <laughs> Another round of applause for Mr. Prabir Chha. Thank you very much for that great keynote address.